Hey everybody, Chris here from lazyfa.com. Welcome back to those of you who are tuning in for another edition of our weekly live chat sessions, and especially a very warm welcome to those new people who have never been here before. This is Market Essentials, a comprehensive framework for getting to know the US stock market. My name is Chris, I'm a software developer, a trader, an entrepreneur, and a passionate instructor and mentor, and I've been involved in the stock market since about 2003. So I'm here to share with you what I believe are the most essential things that you need to know in order to understand and navigate the US stock market. This is gonna be a multi-week, most likely multi-month affair, where each week we will cover a different broad topic related to the market. And before we get started with this stuff, I wanna take a couple of minutes to just give you a broad overview of the different topics that we'll discuss. We'll begin by talking about market fundamentals, which is gonna cover all of the basic stuff like what a stock is, why companies issue stock, and what the stock market is and how it works. We'll then move into identifying trading opportunities, which will hopefully help you to be able to identify opportunities for you to make some money in the stock market. So I'll show you how I use different tools and resources in order to identify those trading opportunities. We'll cover whole market analysis, which will help you to align your trading activities with what the broader market is doing. So looking at things like the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones and the NASDAQ and tying your trading activities with those indexes. We'll have an entire module on risk management, which is something you're absolutely gonna have to master in the stock market because without risk management, you risk losing all your money. We'll also cover technical and fundamental analysis, which are two of the major analysis methodologies that people use to analyze stocks and to predict price movement. We'll get into some things that you may have never heard of. Things like level two, the order book, and time and sales. We will cover how to track your trading performance, which tools and websites and resources are available for you to track your trades and find out what works and what doesn't. And finally, we'll have a module on options trading. If you have questions as we're working through this material tonight, there's a new bot command that you can use slash question followed by whatever your question is, and that will post it automatically to a dedicated channel, which I can then go back and review at the end of the night. So if you have questions as we're working through this stuff, please ask them, just use the slash question command. And if you are watching after the fact on YouTube or Twitch, please put those questions in the comments and I will get back to them there. We're gonna to begin tonight by talking about market fundamentals. And in this module, we're going to achieve six specific goals. First, we'll define what a stock is, why companies issue stock and how stocks are traded in the stock market. We'll also look at the different buying and selling methodologies that traders and investors use when buying and selling stock and some of their advantages and disadvantages. We'll talk about the most important considerations when selecting a broker. We will talk about the three major methods of analyzing stocks and analyzing the stock market, namely technical analysis, fundamental analysis, and hybrid analysis. We will look at the major components of candlestick charts and how to read them. So if you don't know how to read candlestick charts, you will know how to read candlestick charts at the end of this module. And finally, in this module, we will look at the four major US market indexes and what they represent so that you can learn how to tie your trading activity and your investing activity with what the broader market is doing. For the very first section of this entire framework, let's start with what a stock is, why companies issue stock and what the stock market is and kind of how it works. And this is gonna be for those brand new people who have never worked in the stock market before, they've never had a brokerage account, they've never researched a company before. This is for you guys, for the brand new people. So bear with me if you already know this stuff, it's gonna be review for a lot of people, but I wanna start with the absolute basics just so that we capture all of that material for the people who are brand new. And the good news is, for those of you who are brand new, it's not that complicated. A stock simply represents 
ownership of a percentage of an entity. So we're usually talking about a corporation, right? We're talking about some kind of a business and a stock represents a piece of the corporate pie valued per share. So the company gets split up into a bunch of different pieces and each one of those pieces is sold as a share of the company in the stock market and those stocks are valued per share. So each stock has a price per share and then each stock also has a ticker symbol which uniquely identifies it. So if you look at the slide, you'll see some names that you probably recognize, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter. Every single stock has its own unique ticker symbol and that's how it is uniquely identified on the stock exchanges. When you are researching potential investments, a good place to start in order to find some basic information about the company and also to find the company's ticker symbol is on the company website. The other thing that you can do is simply Google for the company's ticker symbol. Usually they're pretty easy to find. The key thing that I want people to take away from this slide is that stock prices by and large are driven by the basic laws of supply and demand. So this is simple, Economics 101, right? High demand, low supply means high price. Low demand, high supply means low price. And the reason that that's important in the stock market is because if we can identify when stocks have high demand and low supply, we can identify when that stock will have a high price. And as traders and as investors, we want to buy low and sell high so that we can make money. So if you understand the basic laws of supply and demand, it makes it much easier to understand why stock prices fluctuate the way that they do and makes it easier to predict where price might go. So this idea of supply and demand is gonna be an overarching theme as we navigate through the rest of this material. We start talking about technical analysis and fundamental analysis and analyzing stock charts and reading financial statements. Supply and demand drives everything. So keep that in mind, take that away from this slide as we move forward. Companies issue stock for primarily one reason, and that reason is to raise capital or to raise money. They'll use that money to do things like expanding their product and service lines or buying buildings and equipment and materials or expanding their staff, basically funding the growth of the company. Now, just like you or I, a company can go to the bank and get a loan to do this kind of stuff, but companies can do something a little bit different also, which is called equity financing. And equity financing is what selling stock into the stock market is. It's kind of like crowdfunding in exchange for profit sharing. So as an alternative to, or in combination with debt financing, Companies will also issue stock, and in exchange for the investment that they get from the public, they will use that money, ideally, to grow the company and to be able to expand its operations and sell more products and generate more income and hopefully increase the share price over time. The stock market then is simply a marketplace for the exchanging of these shares of stock amongst individuals and hedge funds and investment banks and other institutions that have a vested interest in how these companies perform. The stock market is a marketplace where they can exchange their shares of stock. In the United States, the stock market typically refers to these four what are called indexes, and these indexes are like collections of companies that we can use to get a broad understanding of how the economy is doing. So they're the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the NASDAQ. And we'll talk about what those are toward the end of this module, but for now, just realize that when you hear things in the media like the stock market is surging today or the stock market is plunging today, that's what they're referring to are these indexes, these collections of companies that give us a broad view of what the market is doing. So the stock market is sort of like eBay. You have buyers and sellers and the buyers place bids and the sellers place asks or offers. And then there's an intermediary called a market maker who takes all of the orders for people to buy and sell and they match those orders up and they say, this person wants to buy at $10 a share and this person wants to sell at $10 a share and they match them up and a trade is made. And that is what causes stock prices to fluctuate over time based on the laws of supply and demand. Okay, so that does it for the basics of what a stock is, how the market works, why companies issue stock, and so on and so forth. But what about the elephant in the room? How do you know when to actually buy and sell 
in order to make money in the stock market. And the truth is, there really is nobody out there that knows with 100% certainty when to buy and sell. But there are basically four different ways that you can make money in the stock market. And the difference between these different buying and selling methodologies lies primarily in the amount of time that you hold what you have bought. The first strategy we're going to talk about is buy and hold investing. And this is the strategy you're probably already familiar with. This is the stuff that you're going to read about in things like the intelligent investor and stock market for dummies and all of those kind of classic foundational books about the stock market. They're going to be proponents of the buy and hold investing strategy. So this is probably the most common strategy in the stock market, and it's also the one that uses the longest time frame, usually from years to decades. So your mission as a buy and hold investor is not necessarily to focus on the day-to-day -day fluctuations in the stock price or what happens from one earnings release to the next, but rather to focus on the fundamentals of the company and invest in companies that you actually believe have long-term value. In buy and hold investing, you have minimal, if any, desire to try to time the market. The idea behind buy and hold investing is that it doesn't matter when you buy because the stock market goes up over time. Now, you might be asking yourself, what are the advantages and disadvantages to buy and hold investing? Well, one of the advantages is that it doesn't really take any effort day to day in order to do this. You don't need to be sitting at your computer watching the stock market constantly. In buy and hold investing, you're focused on the long term. You're focused on the big picture. So it doesn't really take any effort day to day, which is really nice. The other thing that's really nice about buy and hold investing and probably the most convincing argument to use this strategy is that it's been time tested. So it's been proven over the long term, over centuries of time, that the stock market generally rises. So while nothing is a guarantee, technically, you have a really good chance of making money over the long term if you use this strategy. On the other hand, since you're only doing what the average investor will do, you're going to most likely get average returns with this strategy. Now, average returns are not necessarily bad because on average, the S&P 500 returns something like seven and a half or eight percent per year over the long term. So that's much better than like your standard savings account, for example. But it's still not spectacular. So you're gonna get average returns because you're doing what the average investor does, which is buy and hold. It can also take a significant amount of time to get to those larger returns if you do ultimately get to them because in this strategy, you're stuck waiting for the market to realize the ultimate value of the investment that you've made. And sometimes that can take years or even decades or it might never happen. So not only does it take a long time potentially to get to those larger returns, but it might actually never happen. So you risk tying up large amounts of money for long periods of time, especially Especially if you're unfortunate enough to invest right at the top of a bull market and the whole market takes a dive right after you invest, it might drop for a year and a half or two years, about the length of the average bear market. And then it could take seven or 10 or 15 years just to get you back to break even. And all of that time could potentially be wasted if you do mistime your entry. So there are some disadvantages to using this strategy and as an alternative to it or as a combination with this strategy, there are other ones that are a little bit more active and a little bit more involved. One of the strategies that's slightly more involved than buy and hold investing is what's called swing trading. And this is a common strategy where as opposed to using a long term years to decades time frame, you're going to use a medium term time frame of usually weeks to months. So you buy something, you hold it for a few weeks or a month or two, and then you sell it. And the goal with this strategy is to capitalize on the more short term fluctuations in price. So things that will affect the stock short term, but not necessarily affect it long term. In order to do this, most swing traders will focus on a mix of fundamental and technical analysis. So this is where you start getting into reading candlestick charts and reading SEC filings and analyzing earnings reports and so on. In swing trading, you generally have a moderate desire to try to time the market. So you do want to try to time the market a little bit with this strategy since you're focusing on capitalizing on short term fluctuations in price. 
Now, there are a couple of key advantages to using swing trading as opposed to longer term buy and hold investing. And one of them is that you have the opportunity to make faster returns because you're capitalizing on fluctuations that happen more often in the market. The other major advantage of using swing trading is that if you're good at it, you have the potential to actually beat that average return of the overall stock market because you have more opportunities to make money. Of course, nothing in life is free, right? So you're going to have increased difficulty with this strategy. Swing trading is more difficult than just buying something and forgetting about it for 15 years. It's also more emotional because you have more opportunities to see your investment deteriorate when you're constantly watching the value of your investments fluctuate over those shorter term timeframes. And then of course, as a more involved strategy, swing trading is definitely more time consuming as well. There's a lot more research that goes into it. You have to study the market a lot more with swing trading, but those advantages of getting faster returns and the potential to beat the market sometimes are enough to outweigh the disadvantages of this increased difficulty and more emotion and more time that traders need to spend doing it. Third is day trading, and this is one of the more uncommon strategies in the stock market, but it's also one that a lot of people want to try because it seems exciting. In day trading, like the name implies, you are usually going to be buying and selling the same day. So day trading uses a very, very short term time frame. And there's a high focus on technical analysis in day trading, mainly because from day to day, the fundamentals of the company don't matter that much. For example, it doesn't necessarily matter what next quarter's sales numbers look like or what last quarter's sales numbers looked like in day trading because that stuff is not going to affect the stock on a day to day basis. That'll only affect the stock on a longer term time frame. So in day trading, there's a very high desire to time the market. Now, the good news is that there are two key advantages to day trading, and those two advantages are very fast returns and the potential for very high returns. So since you have so many opportunities to make money throughout the day when the stock prices are fluctuating constantly, in day trading, you have a lot of potential to make very high returns and to beat the market and to do it very quickly. Unfortunately, though, because of the high desire to time the market, day trading is extremely difficult and it really manifests itself as a full time job. With this type of trading, you can lose money really quickly. And like swing trading, day trading is a lot more emotional than just standard buy and hold investing. One of the things that makes this type of trading so difficult is that you have to manage your emotions constantly. When you're involved in a day trade, your profits and losses fluctuate in real time, and this can be difficult for a lot of people to handle. If you've ever seen a professional poker player take a bad beat and go on tilt and just start throwing these huge bets out on cards that aren't really that good, that type of situation is really easy to get into with day trading because things change so quickly. It's also very expensive because you're going to be trading a lot. There's a lot of commissions that go into it. There's a lot of fees in the United States. For example, there is what's called the pattern day trading rule, which requires that you maintain at least $25,000 in your trading account if you're going to be a pattern day trader. So this is a very emotionally charged, difficult, time consuming, expensive type of trading, which is why it has such huge potential for very high and very fast returns. As most people will probably understand, with high risk comes high reward. The last buying and selling methodology is actually two separate ones, and they are scalping and algorithmic trading. Scalping can be done by a human, and algorithmic trading is done by a computer algorithm. Both of these strategies, especially algo trading, are extremely uncommon for individuals. There are people out there that scalp, and with scalping, you're just looking for a quick in and out. So you see an opportunity, you snag a couple of pennies per share, and you take the money and run. There are people that do that. For me, it's a little bit too random, so I don't personally do that, but there are people that do. Algorithmic trading, on the other hand, is impossible for a human being to do. These algorithms are working on such short time frames, nanoseconds and picoseconds, that a human being could not even process it quickly enough. When you read about high frequency trading in the news or in books like Flash Boys or Broken Markets, those are the computer algorithms that we're talking about here. So the major advantages to using an algorithm to trade are that they're extremely high probability and they can be worth billions of dollars because of that high probability. 
algorithms don't have any emotion. So a computer system doesn't have any emotion when it's trading. It's an automated system. And because of that, it eliminates the emotional factors in trading, which cause so many human beings to lose. So these hedge funds and market makers and investment banks that are trading billions and billions of dollars are willing to pay huge sums of money for algorithms that work well. So if you're a software developer, if you are a math geek, the best way for you to make money in the market by using algo trading is to actually develop an algorithm that you have back tested and that will work, which you can then sell to a larger player. Of course, this is not going to be easy. These big players that are using these algorithms that are making billions and billions of dollars per year are extremely protective of the intellectual property that goes into those algorithms. So there's extremely high barriers to entry in this industry. It's very complex and there's a lot of regulatory hassles that you need to go through in order to get into it. Having covered the four different ways that people make money in the markets, let's talk a bit about what you should consider when selecting a broker. I want to focus this discussion in three main areas, and those are the areas of fees, software and speed, and the broker's reliability and fills or their order execution. In terms of fees, the two that you might already be familiar with are commissions and contract prices. So these are the fees that brokers will charge you for trading stock and for trading options contracts. Now, I think it's worth noting that with the advent of some of these brokers like Robinhood that came in and started offering commission-free trading, a lot of these brokers have now eliminated their commissions or lowered them significantly. So this stuff is not as important anymore, but it's still something that you should definitely consider. In particular, the brokers that cater to more advanced traders will usually offer you a choice in terms of your commission, whether you want to pay a flat rate per trade if you trade a lot of shares on every single trade, or if you're trading smaller or trading very expensive stocks, it might be more cost effective for you to pay per share rather than flat rate. You also want to try to keep an eye on these other fees, in particular account maintenance fees and then the data fees and software and routing fees can start to rack up pretty significantly on the more advanced brokers that cater to day traders and swing traders. So you definitely want to keep those things in mind. The key thing here though is that for almost all brokers, if you're a frequent trader, you can and you should negotiate fees. If you're making a thousand trades per year, if you're a day trader, you're trading three, four, five times a day, you should not be paying $7.95 per trade. You should be negotiating that fee down to a couple bucks per trade or getting some other kind of benefit from that broker. And if they're not willing to do that, then you should be using a different one. The next important consideration when selecting a broker is their software. Different brokers will have different software capabilities, in particular in terms of charting and options analysis. Having used a number of different brokers, I've also noticed differences in the speed with which their level two data updates, and we'll talk about what that is later in this framework, but it's effectively pricing updates, the speed with which you see the stock price actually fluctuate, which is really important if you are an active trader. Additionally, different brokers and lighter weight software will typically have better execution speed. So when you click send on your order, you're going to get a faster execution and potentially get in at a better price with a better broker. All of this stuff is super important, especially if you are an active trader. But the best advice that I can give if you're new to this industry is to start simple and upgrade to more advanced software as you become a more advanced trader. Now, I alluded to this in the last slide when I mentioned execution speed, but the last thing that you really want to consider when selecting a broker is their reliability and their order fills or their execution. The bottom line here is that you get what you pay for when it comes to stock brokers. More advanced brokers are going to give you better executions, they're going to give you faster order fills, they're going to get you in at better prices, and they will have better software. These free or ultra low cost brokers are going to suffer from more outages during market volatility, more lags when the market moves quickly, and just in general will be of a lesser quality than these brokers that charge the traditional fees. I will say that using one of these commission free brokers such as Robinhood that keeps it real simple with their app and doesn't have a lot of clutter in their software or on their website, that can be really helpful for people who are brand new to this industry because it cuts out a lot of the noise and a lot of the intimidation factor that comes with more advanced software. 
If you are ready to use a more advanced broker though, these are some of the ones that I would personally recommend that I've used myself. If you're day trading, SpeedTrader Pro, CenterPoint Securities, and TradeStation are all really good. And actually, there's another one which is really popular that's not listed here, which is Interactive Brokers. And they are also very good for day trading and active trading. One of the things that I haven't mentioned that you should consider when selecting a broker is their hard to borrow list. And what that means is the stocks that you'll be able to sell short based on what the broker can borrow. These brokers that cater more to day traders like Speed Trader and Centerpoint and so on, they'll generally be able to get the shares for you to borrow in order to sell stuff short, which is difficult to find on the other brokers like TD Ameritrade and E-Trade and so on. As far as swing trading, I think both TD Ameritrade's Thinkorswim as well as E-Trade Pro are both very good in terms of just having a lot of general good capabilities. Tastyworks, I really like for trading options, but TD Ameritrade is also really good for analyzing options. So Tastyworks is really good because it's a bit cheaper than TD Ameritrade in terms of the per contract costs that you'll incur for trading options. But TD Ameritrade has a lot more in terms of being able to analyze your options trade. So Thinkorswim is definitely a big, bulky, powerful piece of software but Tastyworks is definitely a little bit cheaper and also quite a bit lighter weight, at least as of these recordings. Now, one thing that you should consider is that as you grow and you advance as a trader, there's nothing wrong with having multiple accounts. And in fact, a lot of traders use multiple accounts so that they have options to be able to trade whatever they want and to have the best software and the best platform for doing all these different kinds of trading. So really, every broker has pros and cons, and when you combine all of those different pros and cons together, you end up with a total package which gives you a lot of capability and a lot of flexibility. So that wraps up the first three pieces of market fundamentals, stocks in the stock market, buying and selling methodologies, and choosing a broker. Next time we're going to cover market analysis methodology, so we'll look at technical, fundamental, and hybrid analysis. We'll learn the major components of a candlestick chart and how to read them, and we'll learn the four major U.S. market indexes, what they represent, and how we can use them to guide our trading activities. On that note, if you're watching this after the fact, you don't want to miss that video. Hit the subscribe button, turn on your notifications, like, leave a comment, all that fun stuff, and I will see you next time.